Hi, I'm Chef Julia Dunaway, and I make whole food plant-based no oil dishes. And today I'm going to be making the barley lentil burger. So this is a just one of your typical veggie burgers, but the difference is I'm using barley instead of say brown rice or some other grain. And I'm using lentils, brown lentils, instead of beans. So if you think about veggie burgers, uh, especially vegan veggie burgers that don't use dairy products or eggs, typically they're all very similar. They have some element of vegetables. Usually they all start with onions and garlic and some spices. And then there's usually some kind of vegetable component, maybe carrots, could be bell peppers, just any vegetable you like. Then there's some kind of bean component. Could be pinto beans, kidney beans, lentils. And then there's some kind of grain, like a rice, sometimes breadcrumbs. In this case, we're using barley. And just some other flavorings, uh, some fresh herbs. So we'll be putting some cilantro in here. Sometimes some spice, like I'll be putting serrano peppers in this one. But you get the picture. You, there's not even a specific ratio, but in this case, you'll see the ratio of vegetables and grains to the lentils to the flax meal and all of that. So you can kind of get an idea because the problem with veggie burgers and the reason that people are always looking for a good veggie burger is because they're notorious for having a couple of problems. One is they fall apart. They look good, they taste good, but then when you make them, they just fall into pieces. And the other thing is they're so dense, the inside is mushy and uncooked and tastes not very good, whereas the outside might be cooked pretty well. And so people don't like the texture of the veggie burger. So what I liked about this one is the barley has kind of got a chewy quality, the lentils are not too soft and mushy, and it comes together and makes a really nice texture as well as good flavor. So in this recipe, like a lot of other ones, we're going to saute some things in the pan. I've got my tray of ingredients here, and I'll kind of go over the ingredients as we go. But you can see, you know, there are a lot of aromatics. There's onion and garlic, some typical ingredients here. We'll put in a serrano pepper in the beginning, and then I'll put in some carrots. So these are all the things I'm going to put in my skillet to get started. And we'll kind of get a start on getting these sauteing. And we're not using any oil. So to begin with, I have half of an onion. It's like a medium-sized onion. I like to make a couple of horizontal slits. And then I just go down the onion. It has some lines on it. So you can kind of follow the lines on your onion. And that's roughly a fourth of an inch. Rotate it. And then cut it. And then you get perfect little fourth-inch diced onions. Works every time without a lot of effort. Take a little piece. Cut it up some more, and that's it. Then we have our diced onion, and then I'm going to move it into the skillet. And what I do is I get the skillet going. It's already been, you hear the sizzle. I've had the skillet heating for a few minutes because I want the onions to hit an already hot skillet. I don't want them to sit in a cold skillet. And we don't really, as I said earlier, we don't need to put any sort of water or anything. Sometimes people say that, well, you know, you're making um, plant-based no oil stuff, you're gonna water saute it. And they think to dump a bunch of water in the pan and use the water like oil, well, that's not what you need to do because if you do that, I guarantee you, you'll just have a bunch of steamed vegetables with no flavor and nobody wants that. So we're not really water sauteing it in the sense of using water to saute. We're just, we'll have water available if we need it. So with the garlic, just cut off the hard end and smash it with your knife and then pretty much your garlic's already on its way to being chopped up. Same thing, we'll do three of these garlic cloves because they're not very big. They're on the smaller side. If you have gigantic garlic cloves, you might only need two. These are not gigantic. So we got those. And since they're already kind of smashed a little bit, it's easy to roughly chop them and get them in our pan. And they don't need to be minced into tiny little pieces because, you know, they're going to cook down. So we don't need a fancy garlic press or tool to smash up garlic. In fact, I think that actually doesn't do the garlic any favors when you use these kind of garlic presses. I've never been a big fan of them. And then I'll just take my, I use a silicone 
tool because now here's a very big and unattractive looking piece of onion in here. I'll just cut it, put it back in. I can't use any metal utensils in my pan because it's a non-stick calcalon skillet. And I learned after ruining my last one that you can't really put, can't use metal utensils because it will scratch and you don't want to scratch these things. It's not good. Here's my Serrano chili. Got it from the garden this morning. It's funny, I was prepping for my class and I realized I needed cilantro and some Serrano chilies from the garden, but it was dark. It was like 6 a.m. But I wanted to get this done, so I went into the study and got the headlamp. And I put the headlamp on and I went outside to pick some vegetables. Well, a few minutes later, my husband came in. <laughs> he was just waking up and I still had the headlamp on in my nightgown in the kitchen. And he's like, Where, why are you wearing that headlamp? I said, oh, doesn't everybody wear a headlamp? 6 a.m. in their nightgown. I just laughed. I said, I was out picking fresh vegetables. What do you think? So, you know, the life of a cook, you just do things that need to be done. They get a little water because they're starting to stick. When they get that little, you see a little brown and it starts sticking, that's the time to add the water, not in the very beginning. Okay, so I've got my little bit of water, like a tablespoon, and that will pull it up off the pan so it's not going to stick because you don't want everything sticking. And then I can go ahead and add the carrots. That's half a cup of grated carrots. Just a, use a typical box grater to grate them up. So now I'm going to start adding some of the, the uh, other flavorings. I need some tomato flavor. I like tomato in this kind of dish. Tomato paste gives it a nice uh, rich flavor. This is tomato paste in a tube. It's very handy because you know how it is when you Get a can of tomato paste, you open it up and you use it one time, and then you have all these little, I'm just eyeballing a tablespoon, that's roughly a tablespoon, and you end up with all these little tablespoon measurings of tomato paste and put them away somewhere thinking, oh, I'll use those. Well, I can't tell you how many times when I've cleaned my freezer out, I've found these little bags with measured out tablespoons of tomato paste. So then someone, one of Somebody I know that cooks a lot said, you know, you can get that in tubes. I said, yeah, yeah, I know, and I always forget. Well, now I finally decided to get it in the tubes. That was just a better idea. Okay, so we're going to put in cumin, teaspoon of cumin. Oops, let me get my measuring spoons. And these are the spices that I use, but you can use whatever you like. Some people will say, well, I don't like the taste of this or that. It's like, it's okay. We'll just find something you like. Use garlic powder instead. Uh, and then oregano, about a half a teaspoon of oregano. And now I'm going to put some chili powder in. This is just your common everyday chili powder. Not super spicy, not super mild, probably medium. The store that I go to has like a bulk section where you can get lots of different spices and they have like 15 different kinds of chili powder, a little bit of salt, it's probably like half a teaspoon. And so you can get any level of chili powder that you prefer. So I usually get medium unless I'm getting a specialty one like chipotle flavored or something for a special chili dish. But so you can see this, this is the vegetable kind of aromatic portion of the veggie burger. This is where you're going to get a lot of flavor. It's got, you know, the onions and garlic and cilantro is going to come in here in a few minutes. Um, the chili pepper and all these great things. So now we're going to think about adding our uh, legumes, our lentils, and our greens. So let me go over the lentils for a second. I've already cooked them. We're going to be using um, just about it's like about a, a cup and a half of lentils total, but it's half a cup of raw lentils cooked in a half, one and a half cups of water. And so my choices of lentils, a lot of times I have these heritage lentils from Bob's Red Mill, and they're kind of a cross between green and brown lentils. 
I use those frequently. And then the other one are just brown lentils you get in the bulk section of the grocery store. They call them in this grocery store Spanish pardina lentils, but um, they're, they're brown. Whereas a lot of common lentils are more of the green lentils. So I kind of like for this recipe, the brown ones. So what I've done is I've already cooked them. Then I have them draining here. And I'm going to take half of the lentils. This was a half a cup of lentils cooked. I'm going to take the other half. I'm going to save half of these lentils for my burger, but I'm going to take half of the other ones. And I'm going to puree them in the food processor. And you might have to kind of go down on the sides one time because they kind of float up there. All right, that's all we need to do with that. And the reason for that is we don't want all of the mm, veggie burger to have that kind of uh, pureed quality. We want some solids in here. And remember, some of the complaints that people have about veggie burgers is the, the texture of it is too soft in the middle. It doesn't have a pleasant uh, feel to it when they bite into it. So we don't want to puree everything because that's one of the things I noticed early on when I used to make plant-based stuff is veggie burger recipes would have you pureeing everything with a food processor and then it would be like, nah, I'm not a big fan of that. So then the, here's the other half of the lentils. And the same thing with the um, barley. So I have my barley that I just cooked. It, it was draining. And what I used for my barley was, I found a little uh, box of pearled barley just in the regular grocery store. I cooked it all up, but I didn't need, need as much as I cooked, so I have some extra. It's a good grain, just a good eating grain. Um, you can also use Italian parsley. This was from Whole Foods. And this is kind of a quick cooking, cooks in 12 minutes. You can use homeless barley, which um, is a little bit, uh, has a tougher consistency. And that's pretty easy to find. I just didn't have that around this time. I'm going to turn this off the heat. We'll be adding this in just a minute. But I need three-fourths of a cup of my barley. So I'm going to put half. And don't overcook your barley. It's half a cup and a fourth of a cup is three-fourths. And what I mean by that is if you look at my barley, it's not swollen to the point where it's soft. It's, if you were to taste it, it would have a really nice chewiness to it. And that's how you test it. Can you, does it have sort of an al dente quality to it? Because really barley, when it's overcooked, is not pleasing. It's just kind of um, too soft. I don't know. I can't explain it, but you probably wouldn't like it. So you don't want to overdo it with the the barley, don't overcook it. So we're going to take our processed lentils, our whole lentils, our three-fourths of a cup of barley, and we're going to take our cooked vegetables that we've seasoned and put spices in and wonderful things. I'm going to mix all that in. And also I've got to put my cilantro in my fresh cilantro, I'll set this aside for a minute, and some breadcrumbs. So let's get the cilantro in. This is the cilantro I collected wearing my uh, flashlight on my head. It's really nice to have cilantro growing outside your door because there's so many times where I just need a fourth of a cup of cilantro or a tablespoon or a little garnish. And if you buy it at the store, you know, it lasts for what, three days and then it kind of goes bad. And then you don't want to go to the store just to get a bunch of cilantro. So I've just loved having these plants. And this time of year in Texas, we can start growing, you know, some of these cooler weather plants again. So I went to the nursery the other day and bought a bunch of cilantro plants just to have them because I, love having that. Okay, we're going to put half a cup of panko in here. Um, now, panko breadcrumbs don't always come without oil. In fact, the typical brand, the 
original, this is Kiko Mon brand, but the original Panko bread comes from Pan brand has palm oil in it. So, um, you know, if it says Panko, a half a cup, on the, on the box, then those Panko crumbs have palm oil. But this brand is just Japanese breadcrumbs, Panko. It's not the original brand. They don't have oil. So I put my half a cup of that in. So now what you're looking at is the grains, the legumes, the vegetables, the spices, the, some herbs, and all these ingredients. But what's going to hold this together? See, it's all crumbly. It doesn't have any way to hold it together to keep it into the shape of some kind of a burger. So we have to look at having a binder. And so our binder is going to be flax, a flax egg. In fact, I made two flax eggs. And if you look at it, you can see it looks kind of egg-like. It's very, I've had it sitting here for about 15 minutes. And that's how long it takes to really form into this, this kind of um, gel-like substance, which really is kind of like an egg. If you think of what an egg looks like, you add it to, say, meatloaf. And how I made that was I have a container of uh, ground flax seeds that I use for my smoothies. <laughs> and I, um, for each flax egg, it's one tablespoon of ground flax seed and three tablespoons of water. And I just put two tablespoons and six tablespoons of water in here and let it sit for about 15 minutes. 15 minutes, and that's how I made my flax eggs. So I have two of those. And so between the flax eggs and the, the um, pureed lentils, those are the things that are going to give it that texture that we need to hold this together as a burger. So if you are making any kind of veggie burger and you took, you know, your beans and rice or whatever and some breadcrumbs, you always have to have something to bind it together. Some people use aquafaba, which is the liquid from chickpeas as their binding agent, which is supposed to have kind of an egg-like quality to it. And I used to do that, but I just found that the um, ground flax seeds worked better than aquafaba. So that's what I use now. So then our next step, it's all mixed together. I didn't add any ground pepper. So I think I'll put some freshly ground pepper in here. And again, you know, feel free to use any spices you like. These are just the ones that I picked that I thought would go well with the cilantro, the <coughs> pepper. <laughs> Don't breathe pepper in when you're grinding it because it will itch you, which is what it happened to me. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to form the patties on a parchment lined baking sheet. And <clears throat> I'm going to use a third cup measuring cup. And my experience is for this size, it makes about seven. And I like to kind of pack it in because you don't want them to fall apart, remember? So if you don't pack your burger mixture in, then it's just going to be too loose. So kind of pack it in your measuring cup and then just pop it down. And it may only make six, depending on how tight you pack it in. But and if you're, if you like jumbo burgers, let's say that you wanted to have really big burgers, you know, you're a two-fisted eater, you know, you could use a half a cup instead of a third of a cup. But you get the idea. So I'll do that with all the mixture. And then to form it into patties, then you just press it down. Simple. And then you kind of form the edges as you're pressing down. However thick, however wide you want it, like this one is a little bit smaller and thicker, but let's say I wanted it to be thinner, but bigger than this one, I could make a little bit larger, but thinner. And then you just kind of go around and cut the outside with your hands to keep it from, you know, having an uneven shape on the edges. All right, so the next step after this, we, I'm not gonna do all these right now, but um, an important step is to chill the patties for at least 30 minutes. So I have some that I've been chilling for 30 minutes. And then you can kind of see that after 30 minutes, 
they had firmed up. Of course, you can't really see that they're firmed up, but I can tell. I could pick one up and it stays together. And they haven't been cooked yet, but once they're cooked, this will become even more important. So don't skip the part about chilling the burgers before you cook it for 30 minutes. So the next step is gonna be, I'm gonna start preheating my air fryer here. And then I'm gonna come back here and um, I'm gonna cook them in the air fryer. So I'll be back in a minute with the, the air fried, um, well, actually let me put them on the, the tray and then I'll come back and show you what they look like cooking. So, I've got my air fryer tray. I have a Cuisinart air fryer and I really like it because I can actually see inside the air fryer. I'm only going to do four at a time because I can't do them all at once. So why crowd them all in here? And uh, if you space things out in the air fryer, then the air can circulate around them better. So, okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and get these started and then we'll come back when they're done. Right, so our veggie burgers have cooked for about four minutes. Turn them over, cooked them for a couple more minutes. They only take about six or seven minutes total time. But how you know they're done is, you know, you want them to have a little bit of a, a little brown, crispy outside. And then you know they're done too. You can just tell, you can kind of press on them and tell that they're cooked all the way through. And so now we have to decide what our options are going to be for how we're going to eat the burger. And of course, we have to have a bun or some kind of bread. This is a Dave's Killer Bread 21 grain bun. Uh, I use them sometimes, but there is a trace amount of oil in them, like it's one of the last ingredients. So if you're 100% oil free, you may not want to use this again because my husband really likes them. For myself, I would typically use my own homemade bread which I make a whole grain, 100% whole wheat bread with um, no oil, no dairy. And it can also be made into buns. I taught a bread class recently. So I could use this as my burger bun. But for today, I'm gonna to use, I'll illustrate the burger using one of these traditional buns. So <clears throat> I don't know about you, what you like on your burger, but today I'm gonna to start with a little mustard underneath, Dijon mustard but whatever kind you like. Some people just like traditional yellow mustard. I'm not using a lot because to me, a little mustard goes a long way. I prefer mayo, but since I don't use mayo, what I would use now is um, cashew mayo, cashew-based mayo, which is really good. It's just cashews, lemon juice, a little bit of water. Um, I like to put something like miso in there and give it some umami but there's, that makes a really good plant-based mayo. So normally I would use that, but I'm not using that today. <clears throat> and then we can put other condiments on like organic ketchup, or some people like barbecue sauce. I found a no sugar added, no oil barbecue sauce at Whole Foods. So some people like to put barbecue sauce on their burger. <clears throat> so whatever you like. And then, you know, what, what other things do you like on your burger? Um, of course, lettuce. And then these are some nice hothouse tomatoes, not mine from the garden. My garden tomatoes are kind of at the end. And of course, onion is great. Uh, pickles. I kind of like my, I make my own pickles. I have some sweet and spicy pickles. They're kind of like bread and butter pickles, but a little spicy. So we could put pickles on there. And they've got, see, they've got some little jalapenos in there that are sweet and spicy. So that makes it kind of a nice combination and there's even some pickled onions. Onions and more onions, I like onions. And then, um, I'm not gonna do it today, but a lot of times I'll put avocado on my burger. I'm not gonna use any vegan cheese because I don't need it, but if you had vegan cheese, and you can make your own oil-free vegan cheese, I make a really good vegan cheese sauce that I use for a lot of things, we could have put that on here, but I didn't. So now I've got everything that I need on here. I don't need anything else. I'm going to put it together. And there I have my delicious veggie burger. And the only way we're going to know if it stays together is if I take a bite and try it. 
It stayed together. Hmm. All right. So if you're looking for a really good veggie burger, the barley lentil burger is full of flavor, has a really good texture. It's not going to fall apart on you. It's going to taste good in your bun. And I think everybody <clears throat> that you serve it to will like it. So I hope you make the barley lentil burger. And I did an earlier YouTube video on fries, crispy fries a couple weeks ago that go really well with the burger. So make the crispy fries, make this delicious burger and enjoy it. And I hope you will continue watching my YouTube videos, subscribe to my channel, and you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and I have a website, chef-julia.com, where you can <clears throat> go there and get my classes. So thank you for watching and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.